So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this seventh panel that's part of our digital discussion series on COVID-19, big data and food security. The CGIAR platform for big data in agriculture works to harness the capabilities of big data to solve agricultural development problems faster, better and at greater scale. Uh, feeding the future bite by bite. So we launched this online discussion series to bring emergent research together with on the ground realities um, to converse and map out the different impacts of the pandemic across food value chains and to glean some data driven recommendations and solutions moving forward. So for today's panel, we will discuss data in a crisis climate and the complexities of sources, sourcing and processing data when access is limited. Um, so this morning, we are really happy to welcome Lillian Peterson, winner of the 2020 Regeneron Science Talent Search, Jiraj Amarnath, Senior Researcher and Research Group Leader of Water Risk to Development and Resilience at the International Water Management Institute, Georgia Berry, who's co-founder of the tech startup Farming, and Meta Devere, Senior Researcher, Senior Research Fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute, and module one leader of the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture. So thanks everyone for joining us this morning. It's great to have all of you. Um, this has been a really exciting series. And as I mentioned, we're on our seventh episode. So it's been very fruitful. We've had a lot of voices in the room to engage on, on these topics. Um, so some rules and suggestions for engagement uh, with our panelists this morning. Um, we have a share board, first of all, that um, the link will be posted in the chat if you'd like to connect with others, uh, whether that be panelists or other attendees, um, to, uh, to network, um, seek collaboration in any way, um, feel free to, to enter your info there. Um, uh, so as far as interacting with panelists, we will have our um, panelists present one at a time. You're welcome to pose Q&A or cues for, for our panelists in the Q&A uh, feature on Zoom and I will do my best to get those questions answered by our panelists at the end of their presentation. Um, and any questions that we don't get to, we will try to fill in at the end in our group discussion. Um, so please, I welcome you to, to ask away in, in the uh, Q&A and also engage um, in the chat. It's great to have so many people in attendance this morning. Um, uh, so to start us off, we, we can take a group selfie. Um, this is something that we like to do with all of our, our Zoom panels to, to break the ice and to make sure we document this, because if we were in person, we, we would surely have a photo moment. Um, so we can do that now if you want to put on your uh, Zoom, Zoom smile face. We will have a pick. Everyone, I'm also here for tech support today. So if you have any problems, I'm going to pop my uh, Skype um, uh, name in the chat. And if you do get disconnected, you can message me there. Um, for now, I'm just going to be the photographer too. So I'll count on the count of three, I'll take a photo. So, uh, all right. One, two, three. Thank you all for joining us. Smile. <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Awesome, great. Um, so we'll jump in and we're gonna have Lillian Peterson present first. Lillian is a 2020 high school graduate and an incoming Harvard freshman. She learned how to program in fifth grade and now uses these skills to investigate relevant questions using big data analysis. A few years ago, she created a model to predict crop yields in every country in Africa three to four months before the harvest using satellite imagery. She still keeps this model up to date to monitor current crop conditions. She has two papers in the journals, Remote Sensing and MDPI Climate. Um, we have her GitHub uh, link here as well that I'll share in the chat um, so you can see her work. And um, Lillian, you are more than welcome to begin a presentation on crop modeling across Africa. Great, thank you so much. Let me just share my screen here. Um, so thank you for inviting me to uh, on this panel today. And uh, thank you um, for the introduction. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how well you can predict crops using a system that is completely remote and its limitations. 
Africa has poor monitoring and reporting of weather and crop health. As you can see here by the number of good daily weather stations in 2015. This makes it difficult to monitor crop health and it increases our reliance on remote sensing and observers on the ground. But as the mobility of data collectors is being impacted by COVID-19, we have fewer observations and more uncertainties. A few years ago, I created a low cost early warning system for low crop yields that can be applied in every country, crop, and climate. My, um, I obtained MODIS satellite imagery from the Descartes Labs satellite platform. And I obtained this for two regions, in Illinois, which served as a proof of concept and validation, and then for every country in Africa. I then computed the pixel-wise anomalies of NDVI, EVI, and NDWI, and um, co found correlations between the NDVI anomalies and the, corn, uh, and the crop yields. Here you can see the NDVI anomalies for Ethiopia during a wet year, where there are much higher NDVI anomalies, and during a drought year, where there are much lower NDVI anomalies. The advantages of this system is that it Maybe. uses... I don't know if you're trying to change slides, but we can't see the next slide. Oh, whoops, uh, that's not very good. It's just, uh, it's still in your title slide. Okay, so, um, thank you for that. Let me try to... Yeah, thanks, Meta. <laughs> well, this is a problem we've never actually had before, so... <laughs> that's weird, even uh, check, check yeah. beforehand, so it seemed to be working. Um, I'll just go back to this slide. So this is the uh, number of good daily weather station data, uh, good weather station, good weather stations in 2015. Um, and this is the NDVI anomaly in Ethiopia during a wet year and during a drought year. So the advantages of this system um, are that it uses MODIS satellite imagery. So it's less satellite data to handle and MODIS has a return time of about one day, so I don't have to worry very much about cloud cover. It also uses no crop mask. It just uses the VI anomalies for every pixel. Um, and it only uses national crop production data from the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service. So it does not rely on county or state level data. This means that it can rapidly be expanded to new areas of the world even if there is no uh, reporting there. I first conducted a validation in Illinois where I found correlations between the um, NDVI, EVI, and NDWI anomalies and the end three crops, corn, soybeans, and sorghum. Here you can see in the green is the corn yield for Illinois from 2000 to 2016, and the blue is the NDVI anomaly. They are highly correlated at 0.9, and this correlation remains high when you look at the correlation for every county and year since 2015. During a dry year, there are lower corn yields and low NDVI anomalies, and during the wet year, there are high corn yields and high NDVI anomalies. I then conducted a train test split validation where I trained the linear regression on a random 90% of the data and then predicted the remaining 10% and repeated this procedure 10 times. I found that my predictions had an average error of 6%. These low errors in Illinois show that my model has good predictability for crop yields. I then apply this model to every country in Africa and process satellite imagery for every country. I chose farming dense regions in each country in order to limit the amount of satellite data I was processing because uh, as a sophomore in high school, I had limited computing resources and did all of this on my home laptop. So I could only process a limited amount of data. Here, uh, I computed the monthly NDVI, EVI, and NDWI averages and anomalies. And here you can see the NDVI averages for three example countries, Morocco, Tunisia, and Ethiopia. I then found correlations between the month with the highest NDVI value and the crop production for the highest producing crops in each country. I then predicted 
future crop production for the 2018 harvest and later compared it to reported values. The error in Ethiopia was less than 1%. I repeated this procedure for every country in Africa. Some difficulties of predicting crop yields in Africa include inaccurate reporting due to insufficient technologies or lack of oversight, clouds for many months at a time in Central Africa, and some countries have multiple growing seasons within a single year. But despite these difficulties, 20% of my predictions had less than a 2% error, and 40% had less than a 5% error. And again, these are just my predictions for the 2018 harvest. I then further analyzed these errors by the VI index, the crop, the country, and how good the season was, whether it was an average season, much above average, or much below average. Because it is important to have a crop monitoring system that can predict crop yields in any circumstance. I continue to keep this model up to date and make current crop predictions. As of July 20th, uh, my model predicted that most countries in Africa would have below average seasons, uh, but I'll talk about some of the limitations of this in the next slide. So I created a simple system that does not rely on detailed ground observations, can quickly predict crop yields anywhere, on the, anywhere in the world on major cereal crops, is reasonably accurate, and serves as a proof of concept of how well you can predict crop yields even if you have zero observers on the ground. Timely obs ground observations from CGIAR partners refine the accuracy of predictions and thus their relevance to stakeholders and policymakers. But these ground observations are less certain during COVID-19. Limitations of this model and other models that are completely remote during COVID-19 include that they can't detect reduced or delayed planting when weeds grow on the fields. They are sensitive to droughts but not floods. Um, and farmers could grow crops but be unable to harvest, uh, harvest the crops, store them, or get them to markets. Um, and that's the end of uh, my presentation and I'm open to any questions. Uh, thank you again. Thanks so much, Lillian. That was great. Um, so to get us started in our discussion, I'll pose to you a question that uh, has come in from the audience. Um, so let me see. Um, it's from Bhavani, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Is crop yield data generated from remote sensing data or field data? So will you just clarify for us um, in a setting like the one that we find ourselves in currently where access might be limited um, due to different restrictions, how much in-person um, data collection and observation is needed? Where is your data coming entirely from remote sources? Just to give some clarity on that. Yeah, absolutely. So. This uh, system only uses national crop production data. Um, and I use this data, it can be found on Index Mundi, but I'm pretty sure it's originally from the USDA Foreign Agricultural Service. So it's basically one number per country and crop per year. Um, so it's very limited data, and a lot of countries um, likely have inaccurate reporting, even of that very low resolution crop yield data. So in countries where that's the case, the system can solely rely on the NDVI anomalies as a proxy for crop health, although it can be better calibrated to the individual conditions of the country when it is given the national crop production data, or it would work even better with more local crop production or, or crop yield data, but I only had access to the national numbers. So uh, out of, some, out of um, necessity, actually, because um, I didn't have access to any higher resolution crop yield data, I had to use just one number for each country and year. Okay, all right. Um, so a question that I have for you is, um, you know, obviously satellite imagery and geospatial data is in some ways like a, a a great setting to find yourself in for research in these times. It's contactless, socially distanced. Um, do you think that others have, have seen more value in applications for research method, methods such as um, the ones you're using because of, because of the pandemic? 
Uh, yeah, I definitely think that people are paying a closer, uh, paid people are paying closer attention to remote systems that only rely on uh, remote sensing or uh, other forms of uh, remote monitoring because anything that is on the ground or requires human contact is so much more difficult during these times. Um, I think um, COVID-19 could lead to a large increase and improvement in a lot of these remote monitoring technologies because um, they're becoming a necessity where uh, we don't have access to uh, a lot of the ground observers that we normally have access to. So I'm, ho I'm hoping that it could lead to a large jump and improvement in a lot of the remote technologies. Yeah, that's a theme that we've seen across um, these discussions is the pandemic really accelerating change and adoption of new technologies and research methods. Um, so will you talk a little bit more about how predictive crop modeling, like your work, can help to build resilience in food systems in the long term so that when crisis situations like these arise, we have um, kind of a baseline of of knowledge and work to um, to start off with to tackle to tackle these sudden challenges. Yeah, so um, since I'm in high school, I feel like I don't have as broad of a knowledge of this as uh, many people, like the other panelists or many other people in the audience probably. But um, I would say that uh, timely ground observ uh, timely observations and um, predictions for the next harvest can. Uh, lead to a lot of improvement, and I've actually done a lot of other research in mal in uh, the in working with like malnutrition and reducing malnutrition in Africa. So one of the things I'm focused on is if you can predict low harvests early in the growing season, then that would give sufficient lead time to uh, bring in the needed supplies and people into an area to uh, reduce a food crisis and to um, respond in enough lead time to reduce malnutrition. This is extremely important because malnutrition in children is actually the leading cause of death and uh, is responsible for 3 million child deaths each year. Um, and if we can, and it also for children who do survive, it, re it hinders brain development. So if we can reduce malnutrition, then that could be a large step towards reaching the other sustainability goals and um, development overall. Yeah. All right, thanks so much, Lillian. If any um, audience members have further questions or panelists, further questions for Lillian, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A and we can, we can come back at the end of presentations. Thanks again, Lillian. Thank you. So we'll move on to our second panelist, Giraraj Amarna. Uh, Giraraj is a senior researcher with the International Water Management Institute. His research focuses on developing solutions to climate risk management using advanced science and technologies in different hydroclimate regions. He leads a research program on water risks to development and resilience that aims to strengthen agricultural disaster risk management in South Asia and African countries, namely index-based flood insurance, bundled insurance solutions with seeds and climate information services, drought monitoring and early warning in addressing food security that can help small colder farmers adapt to climate change. He is also the recent winner of the World Geospatial Excellence Award for the work on the South Asia drought monitoring system to mitigate drought risks. Giraj, feel free to begin your presentation uh, whenever, you, whenever you feel like it. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, is my screen is visible now? Yes, I can see your, your screen sharing. Yeah. Thank you so much. So it's a very fascinating to be here and uh, congratulating the previous speaker for giving excellent overview of what she has done. Uh, commendable job. So big congratulations again. Uh, here, um, I would like to briefly highlight on the technology inputs, what we have been working uh, in response to COVID strategy here. Uh, I would quickly go into this tool as a starting point of our discussion. So uh, this is uh, basically a crop is mainly to see how uh, we could monitor the uh, timely harvest of the crops in any part of the world. So in reference to what the previous speaker spoken about, the uh, strength of remote sensing data is widely used here. 
and we have used the source of Google Earth Engine coming from machine learning algorithms, the classification approach from random forest. So there are a bunch of uh, technology that has been used, but in summary, what we would like to present here is when the lockdown was started, uh, the farmers and the communities were completely locked because they were not able to go outside. But that is a time where we were seeing that the crops were in the matured stage and uh, uh, we were worried about how this uh, timely harvest will happen. If there is a delay, there can be some pest diseases or it can be a number of reasons that farmers could have a significant crop losses. So uh, it does not mean that we were uh, influencing the policy, but the idea is to put that uh, data in public domain. And a lot of these data sets are open access when it comes to access to remote sensing data. We prepared this and shared to a few countries in Africa as well as in Asia. The idea is to show in reference to last year, if you have a crop which is in standing and in the peak stage of harvest, we were providing a location specific information where and how the crop harvest can likely happen. So we were producing this product on a weekly basis and providing this information to interested users who could make use of this data. And again, as I said, uh, in my next slide, you can clearly see here the difference between um, before, right after the COVID lockdown and then a couple of uh, weeks later, the harvest is completely gone here. You can see almost 80 to 85% of the crop is uh, completely harvested. It really shows that uh, you could immensely use your satellite data to convey the policy response. And we can really see that it has happened significantly in India where the government have relaxed certain restriction for farmers to go use their missionaries and the harvest their data. There has been a lot of some guidelines has been issued by the government. When do you reach to the uh, market in terms of accessing the labors for harvest? There has a lot of been um, elements that has been studied on. So the good part is that it has been a fairly a technology driven data you could develop quickly with the kind of uh, data sets that are publicly available. The other example I, I would like to also focus on uh, is there is really a COVID impact that is uh, in, uh, addressing the farmers. So what we have been looking is a lot of Facebook mobility data which is available this is basically the uh, local or any communities who are using the mobile data, you, you could access this data. And what happens uh, during the lockdown, you see that almost 50 to 60% of the people have to stay in home. And then uh, a couple of weeks before the lockdown has been released, that is also the time of uh, monsoon in the early June. And there has been uh, quite a significant uh, rainfall. Uh, we have noticed a large part of the India. And then what we can see from the satellite image very clearly that uh, you could see in the month of June to July, now there has been a significant increase into the uh, crop coverage area. In fact, it turns out to be that 21% increase in the overall crop cover this year, which is very fascinating news for the communities. But again, there are certain limitations when it comes to access to cash or delaying uh, the loan disbursement. And again, there are uh, multiple uh, flood events have happened in this part of the world. So my point is uh, your data is now available in open access when it comes to Google mobility data or Facebook data. You could make really a, a usefulness of this data set connecting when the crop season is happening. This is the time where the loan disbursement should happen because farmers have to buy a better fertilizers or we decide to mitigate some of the any crop damages that can happen. So this is again, I see that the usefulness of uh, AI or other tools or uh, including IoT plays a critical role here. And my uh, last slide also to uh, bring in the aspect while we can talk about monitoring, we need to also understand what kind of risk is this region is exposed to. So we looked at uh, quite a, a lot of global data like data from uh, harvest data on the spam, the spatial allocation model, the data coming from Water Resource Institute on the extreme water risk areas, water scarcity or water availability. So we have put a lot of data set and try to see that how much of these countries are under risk and how much of the areas they will be have to crop diversified. So it's just a beginning part of the research we started looking at. Uh, while we are all talking about a, a diversified data, you can uh, really thank uh, 
a lot of uh, open access institutions are coming up, which is providing a lot of data, including agencies like UFRI. So it clearly shows that the researchers like me or any other private sector has an opportunity to use the uh, data that is coming from the secondary sources or the data coming from the space agencies or any other form of data. So I would say that we are in a very uh, um, right time of using such very diverse resources of data to really look at the problem areas, how we could systematically monitor and provide solutions like the other speaker spoken in the previous presentation as well. So I stopped here and there are a lot of materials available. Feel free to go through and I can be reached over by the email. Thank you again. Great, thanks Giraj, and thanks for making yourself available for contact. My first question that I'm gonna to pose to you is coming from the audience, it's from um, Aidan. How do you solve the problem of spectral resolution of images and what approaches do you use in solving the issues of cloud cover in images? Garage, were you able yeah. to so I think it's a very common uh, issue when it comes to using remote sensing data. So uh, one, yeah, you can hear now. There's a there's a bit of a lag. We can still hear you. Yeah. Okay. I was okay. Let me. There we go. I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I was just saying that uh, there is a, uh, always the issues of cloud and other atmospheric issues will come. But when we build a, a data fusion method, you come with some cloud correction procedures. And there is also an opportunity of using uh, optical and SAR data. You have a, a better way to address this uh, data challenges, what you are speaking about cloud issues or time series data that can really help us. And again, AI or machine learning algorithms can really able to provide you a right kind of a pixels that you could determine the NDVI. That's how the global uh, agencies are working on quality data sets development. Okay, great. I hope that I hope that got to Aidan's question. Another discussion point that I have for you is, as you mentioned, um, platforms like Google Earth Engine and advances in cloud computing and cloud storage have really made um, this type of analysis more accessible um, in recent years. So um, what are some consequences that you've seen of this increased accessibility? Um, what innovations or new applications have you seen as a result? Uh, I think this, uh, these are new opportunities that are emerging in recent years when it comes to access to cloud computing, whether it is Google or Amazon. And they are increasingly looking for uh, the best applications one could develop from the research domain. So at this point, it's a lot more has been provided into the open access. You could a uh, lot more like it's a way where you could access some um, email account after a few years, they will be charging you. So while you are processing a lot of this data, you will be using a lot more data set it means that you will be accessing their Google Cloud services in the years to come. So there will be subscription, but the overall idea here is that uh, people will be able to adapt to cloud framework. Unlike uh, in the couple of years before, a person have to go and download the data, do the processing. Uh, we will be 90% of our time spending time in processing the data rather than doing analytical tool. Like the previous speaker spoken about a continental scale Africa product. I don't think uh, if you could uh, simply do that sitting in home and downloading the data set. So it's a big push on the cloud revolution. I think almost every researchers and institutions will migrate to this era of cloud solution, I would say. Another question coming in from the audience from Olipa. How reliable is the crop harvest tool for irrigated crops, they ask? Yes, so uh, I think we have to look, it's not a uh, very generic uh, crop harvest tool. We have to look at uh, the uh, what type of season of the crop we are looking at. Is it a rain fed crop? Is it an irrigated crop? So we might need to go more rule based classification if we talk about crop harvest. So if I'm in a specific summer crop, I know what is the crop planning when the crop will grow and when it is going to be harvested. So you can define a lot of rules uh, in your remote sensing data, train your algorithm so you know the specific irrigated areas are there and you know when you can assign a crop calendar 
and those are the period that you can harvest it. So we might need to systematically develop some functional factors to define this uh, uh, agriculture systems when it comes to a harvesting period. All right. And the last question that, I'm, that I'll pose to you, um, returning to some of your examples of how um, India has been able to navigate um, food value chains, food security during this time, um, what are some specific ways that you've seen um, satellite imagery, geospatial data be able to um, inform decisions or support policy that have enabled these positive outcomes? whether that be um, having labor and machinery in place for when crops are ready to harvest, being able to um, mediate transport of crops, some specific applications of, of, your, of your work. Yeah, I don't have a complete insights on the field data while I'm just all looking from the media reports and some of the of, uh, reports that are coming. Generally, I think uh, we need to have bottom-up approach. It cannot be just a top-down approach from remote sensing. We need to also uh, hear from the uh, community uh, data or from the government sources if you are really talking about uh, the policy. I would say the policymakers who are sitting in the sub-state level are gathering certain field data and they are trying to uh, ensure that whether it is comes to access to inputs or whether it comes to market pricing, whatever it is, I think we need to look at holistic approach rather than just depending on remote sensing based information alone. Yeah, that's an important perspective. Thanks for that. So I'm going to pass it over to our third presenter, Georgia Berry. Uh, thank you, Giraj. Uh, Georgia is the co-founder of the tech startup Farming. Farming delivers interactive and engaging digital training to small-scale farmers via a smartphone and has previously been the winner of the CGIR Big Data Inspire Challenge. Georgia is equal part software developer, UX designer, and content creator, and has previously worked with organizations such as TechnoServe and GSMA. Um, so today, Georgia is going to present on using already established social networks to connect rural farmers with important information. Over to you, Georgia. Hi, everyone, um, and thanks for the invitation to such an interesting session. Um, so I'm going to change things up a little bit now because we've been looking at a from space view of how we collect data in a climate, in a crisis climate, and I'm going to kind of bring it back down to earth and, and talk a bit about how we collect data on the ground, how we can collect data directly from farmers. And so Farm Inc has been building digital advisory services for small scale farmers for a few years now. And um, we've trained over a quarter of a million farmers. And what's probably most pertinent to talk about in this discussion today is that we this year launched a new platform called Learn Inc. Uh, which is essentially harnessing the technology that we've built over the last three to four years and um, essentially open sourcing it so that you uh, so that other organizations can plug in and use what we've built so you can essentially translate your content into a digital form and deploy it with your with your users with your network um, and this is interesting because um, in a crisis um, you need to be able to deploy quickly and we've designed our platform so that you can rapidly get your content online and rapidly um, draw data from, from the people that you need to learn from. So I'm going to walk through a little bit today around a case study um, which is a project that we're working on right now with Ilri who I'm sure most of you are familiar with. If not, it's the International Livestock Research Institute and we've been working with them for a few years now. And we have just been awarded the CGR Rapid Response Grant to essentially train dairy farmers on how to reduce the spread of COVID-19. So I'm going to share my screen and talk to you a bit about how we think about this. So hopefully you can all see my screen now. Um, so the objective of the project that we're working on with Ilri is to um, see a behavior change among Kenyan dairy farmers, whereby they're able to take simple steps to reduce the spread of infectious disease, including COVID-19. 
And the reason why we chose dairy farmers and we thought dairy farmers are an interesting group is because many of the messages that are currently being pushed out around how to reduce the spread of COVID are exactly the same as the kind of messages that need to be shared with dairy farmers around how to reduce the spread of other types of infectious disease. So actually it fits really nicely with the kind of information that we need to share with those, with those farmers. Um, so this is, this is how we think about the process of responding uh, rapidly to a crisis. And um, we're aiming to get live results within eight weeks of this project. So we start out by collecting in existing data and, and source material, and then we use that to rapidly create an initial draft training for the farmers. Then we use a test with our target users using remote uh, testing technology, which I'll talk about briefly. And then we use um, digital channels such as um, Facebook and WhatsApp to quickly spread um, this digital training with an initial cohort of users. And then we can measure, uh, quickly measure our early stage impact using live data dashboards, which is the piece that we'll be open sourcing over the next few months. And then we iterate based on uh, the data that's being generated. So we iterate the content and so on once we understand how people are responding to it on the ground. And so I'll walk you through a little bit of how that looks in, in real life. So, we started out working with the Ilri team to identify um, what we saw were the four main learning objectives for this training. Um, and essentially that was to, to be able to convey to farmers what an infectious disease is and how infectious disease is spread. Um, to explain to them what the simple steps are that they can take to reduce the risk of COVID-19 and reduce the risk of spread. And then to understand how, um, what the risk of disease is around milk contamination and how they can keep their livestock um, safe from disease. And then, and so this is the platform that we've created and any organization can sign up to this platform and you can you get a monthly subscription uh, to our platform. Um, and please email me if you want to know more information. I'm very happy to talk through um, what we can do with you. Um, but this is how the platform looks. And so these, these uh, cards here represent the different modules of the digital training. And so if I click on one of these modules and then click edit lesson, you can see that the lessons we create are in the format of essentially a, a chat, of a conversation. And this is because we find this to be the most effective way to convey information and to see retention of information among this, this, these kind of users. Um, and within these lessons, you can also add um, survey questions. So I'll show you an example of that. So for example, you can add multiple choice survey questions and it's really easy to edit this information, to type in here, uh, you can switch things around, uh, you can delete cards if you want to, and um, then you can quickly preview and see how your training looks on a phone. And then alongside each lesson, we also create quiz questions. So I'll show you how, how that looks here. So you can create essentially multiple choice quiz questions, again, in a really easy kind of drag and drop interface. And you can preview how these generate interactive quizzes on a phone. And here we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about how to create a kind of fun, engaging experience, how to gamify um, that experience. Um, you can you collect badges and points and so on as you move through the training. Uh, I'm gonna get some of these wrong on purpose. Um, and, so, and so this is how the, the, quiz, the quizzes look. And then you can quickly publish your course and then you can see it live on a, on a phone. So if you, if you click on this link, which is something you can easily share in say a WhatsApp group, then anyone who, who gets that link can quickly access um, this training. Um, and within here, we integrate features such as um, discussions, 
So at the end of each module, you can join a discussion and people can actually engage with the content, ask questions and so on. We also integrate um, games and challenges to keep the learning experience kind of fresh and engaging. And all the while your users are, are interacting with this, we're generating data. Um, so let me click through here, let me move this out the way. Um, on our kind of live analytics dashboard. So you can see in real time how people are using the service. I mean, this data is all pretty low at the moment as we haven't actually released it yet. And you can even see down to the individual question level, um, how are people answering the questions? Uh, where are people getting them right? Where are people getting them wrong? How are people answering survey questions and so on? Um, so essentially what we've developed is a really quick way for you to respond to crisis situations and be able to get information out to people through a smartphone um, and generate data that you can quickly uh, respond to. Uh, and one, sorry, one thing I should have mentioned is uh, we do all of our user testing remotely. Obviously um, with COVID, we don't have much choice, but we do that anyway. Um, and we use a tool called Look Back. And we can, talk, we can definitely talk more about that if you're interested to know more about it. Um, but it means that we can generate quick feedback within an hour of creating the course content. So I think that's everything from me. So please, um, please ask some questions. Thanks, Georgia. That was great to get, get an inside look at the, at the platform. Um, it's so awesome to see how these projects that um, I know our Inspire Challenge projects have poured so much, so much work into and seeing them take on these new um, objectives, new lives in, in the rapid response phase is, is really rewarding. Um, so I can see how, um, how focused the project is on user experience. That's been an important part of, of farming from the beginning. And at least for me this time seeing the demo, like it was so striking to see how um, you've designed the training to be a conversation in a time that we can't be having so many in-person conversations, but that that model is still really effective for, for conveying this knowledge. So what qualities about your, um, your existing platform before you pivoted to these new COVID objectives do you think lent the type of um, qualities and like resiliency that you needed to be able to react um, quickly and effectively to the new challenges presented by the pandemic? Sure. So, I mean, interestingly, it was, it was kind of a, a stroke of luck for us, really, that we finished building this platform around about February this year, um, which was just obviously at the same time as the pandemic struck. So within about two weeks of finishing of, of the platform going live, we had our phone essentially kind of ringing off the hook with people saying, how can I digitize my training? And we've done everything from commercial companies wanting to train their agent networks and um, to be able to work remotely um, who are selling, you know, solar installation kits through to the kinds of projects you see here around kind of disaster response through to we're even working on a project that's kind of quite topical for some of the discussions earlier around how to validate uh, satellite data on the ground. So how to use this technology to collect information from farmers about their yields um, at, the, at that point in time on their specific field. So it's, it's quite a flexible platform. And I think we were lucky, actually, that we, we released it at exactly at the moment when so many organizations are having to start thinking seriously about how they work remotely and how they use these kinds of digital channels. Yeah. Um... A question coming in from the audience here from Shashwat is, is there a way for farmers who do not have continuous internet access uh, to make full use of this while being offline most of the time? Sure, that's a, that's a great question actually. And, and one of the things we um, were really interested in, in terms of creating this platform, was to address some of these really ch challenging problems. So one of the things we've seen in the past is that lots of organizations have created their own apps or their own web apps. And actually some of the things that are really, really challenging, um, but absolutely necessary for this market, are just too difficult for every single organization to tackle individually. And one of those things, for example, is how to create 
effective offline access to materials. So that's something we're working on at the moment, should be within the next release, um, so that you can actually download course content offline. Another one is how you can deliver notifications uh, through a phone um, just using the browser, not requiring an app install, which is another thing that we've been working hard on. Mm -hmm. um, another piece of the, of the puzzle that's really important is how to ensure that it's really data light. Um, which is another reason why a conversation works really well because it's text and so the kind of the amount of MBs that the user is downloading each time they're using the service is actually very, very small. Um, so these are all kind of really, really tough problems that it makes much more sense for an organization like us to address for everyone's benefit rather than for every single organization to try and tackle on their own. Yeah. Following this line of kind of talking about accessibility and inclusion, um, part of the part of the project's um, kind of commitment is to reaching 50% of female farmers in the user base and to also uh, disaggregating the data based on gender so that you can get some insight into relationships among, among gender and these learning outcomes. So will you talk a little bit about um, the gender dimension of the project um, what what steps you're taking and and things you expect to see or learn? Sure. So I actually didn't show it in the presentation just then, but on the data dashboard, you can split everything by male, female. So you can see the level of activity and engagement um, for, for both men and women. And that's really important for us because um, one of the problems we see is that you know men are more likely to have access to smartphones, they're more likely to have access to data or an internet connection, um, and so you see a skew always towards male users. I actually used to work, if anyone knows, the GSMA Connected Women team. That was my previous job, so I'm very aware of that issue. Um, so one of the things that we do in terms of how we market and distribute our service is that if we're seeing that skewed towards predominantly male users, then we do targeted marketing using channels such as Facebook ads, where you can target specific um, segments. So for example, you can run ads that will only show on the phones of women. And then you can also adjust the, the messaging to understand what's working better for those, those kind of users. And that's something we've done in the past and, and we've seen has been really, really effective. So it's definitely an issue, it's, but it's definitely not an unsolvable issue. Yeah, that's good. That's great to hear. The last question that I'll pose to you now, um, and if any audience members would like uh, to ask further questions, please do so. We can come back at the end. This question is from Magali, Magali Leon from our Facebook Live broadcast. What type of companies or entities use your product? Yeah, so as I said, it's a real mix at the moment. So from commercial companies, even outside of the farming space, we've seen commercial companies in, say, the solar space, soil testing companies, um, through to research institutions like ILRI. Um, we're working with, um, some of them are under NDA, so I never quite know what I can say. Um, so a, a kind of a whole mix. And uh, one of the places where we see a real success is where people are doing a kind of a train the trainer model. So particularly where people are say training um, extension workers or agents who they know will have a smartphone and will be able to you know, have um, good enough access to uh, data and so on. And are then able to share that information with their networks. Um, and one of the things we used to do that often is WhatsApp. Um, because many organizations who have existing say agent networks already have existing WhatsApp groups of those agent networks. So they can quickly push out these trainings through those um, pre-existing kind of digital groups. Um, so yeah, the answer to your question, it's, it's a whole mix, both within agriculture and outside of agriculture. Yeah, and that's another commonality from, from this discussion series is that WhatsApp has um, taken on so many uses and been really applicable for a lot of different projects. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Georgia. I'm going to turn it over to Meta Devere, our fourth panelist. Uh, Dr. Devere is a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute. She received her PhD from Cornell in crop and soil sciences and has worked as an agronomist for CGIAR. 
Previously, Mata led a project in Nepal to improve productivity and profitability in farming systems, working closely with farmers to implement sustainable management practices. She's one of the key data architects for the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture and the platform's module one lead. She's also the author and architect of the Guardian Ecosystem, which is CG, CGIR's flagship data harvester, enabling the discovery of publications and data sets from across all CGIR centers and beyond. Um, so Meta is going to present on the Guardian Ecosystem. Feel free to start when you're ready, Meta. Okay, so I hope you can hear me and I sure hope you can see my screen. Let me know if you cannot or if the slides don't advance. So um, I'm going to dive right in and, and talk a little bit about, build essentially on what, what the other speakers have, have been talking about. Um, it's, it's been fairly clear, I think, to all of us that everything that, that we're, we're trying to do relies very heavily on data um, and data access. And not only access, but being able to interpret uh, and reuse the data that's already collected. So essentially what we're talking about is getting from this kind of siloed data um, uh, uh, system or, or uh, environment to something more uh, where you can, uh, you know, do something useful with the data, not only just find it, but but actually operate on it. And what I've shown you here is is the National Center for Biotechnology Information. It's a it's a very old screen grab, but it shows you all of the different kinds of databases and the data that's contained in them that that is available. But there's a whole lot of tools um, that you can use to interact uh, with with the data and do something useful. The derive insight from the data essentially, and what what that takes is, is the use of consistent standards, common tools and platforms, um, certainly interoperability because you need to be able to understand what the data is about, what it's trying to tell you, um, and consistent metadata. So, so without this, it's very difficult to actually um, get to the kinds of things that particularly Lillian and, and Giriraj were talking about. So um, what have we done? Uh, uh, Hannah mentioned the Guardian Data Ecosystem. That's sort of a, a that, that's a key big data platform product. What I'm showing you here is the entire ecosystem, but I'm going to be focusing primarily on certain pieces of it. So that the heart of the ecosystem is, is really the, the sort of, if you want to call it the data portal, we call it Guardian, really, the, the, the global agricultural research data innovation and agricultural network. Uh, innovation network. It's quite a mouthful, just call it Guardian without the U. Um, we also have a lot of work on going on the standards part of what I just showed you in, in terms of breaking down the silos. Uh, we're trying to make data semantically, um, semantically understandable, semantically uh, uh, actionable really. And that means using certain semantic standards um, uh, metadata schema, etc. And tied to that increasingly is, is the need to um, make sure that your data, set, data assets don't contain uh, uh, privacy, you know, information that's going to be damaging um, to the, the constituents who you're, you're working with. So we have an, a privacy information checker as part of this ecosystem as well. So those are the two cogs you see at the top. The top one is essentially enabling the collection of data that's already standardized. And the bottom cog, which says ontology, metadata, tagging tools, et cetera, um, is, is, a, a, is it refers to our efforts to, to take data that's already been collected that may not be conformant with semantic standards and build easy workflows to make them uh, much more easy to, to, to um, act on. The, the parts that I'm going to be focusing on today relate much more to uh, the heart, which is the Guardian uh, data portal, essentially, um, and the pipelines that we're trying to do, the so what of being able to, you know, find data. What are you going to be able to do with it? Um, so, so the analytics and model pipelines, uh, for instance, to models like uh, Wofast and DSAT, we've already built out some of those pipelines. Um, and then uh, the, the visualization aspect of it, data exploration, mapping, uh, and analysis uh, of, of the data that, you, that you're able to visualize. So be, being able to easily inter, interact with the data that's, that's, uh, that you're looking at, um, the maps that you're looking at, and being able to download slices of those, those data. So uh, let me dive right in and show you what Guardian looks like. This is that, that heart of the the being able to find the data, being able to access the data that, that you're looking for. And I can do a, 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 you know, a search like this, vulnerability climate. Uh, I think on the think on the thought that, you know, the 
with COVID-19 particularly, those who are already vulnerable to uh, challenges like, you know, climate related challenges are likely perhaps to be more vulnerable to, to um, the, the pandemics. For instance, you might want to test that hypothesis. You want to find the data, you go to Guardian, you do this kind of data search. And what you see um, here, I'm pointing just to the data sets. You will find data sets and publications. We have almost 200,000 publications now uh, and almost 30,000 data sets available from a variety of different sources. Um, here I'm showing for this particular search about 40 data sets um, from across, mostly from across the CGIR system. All of the different centers really, or many of the different centers are, are, um, uh, are here. This is just a screen grab uh, of a few of the data sets of these 40. But we also have data uh, that we're making discoverable that is now sitting at the World Bank, USAID, uh, DFID, the Government of India's Open Data Portal, USDA, and, and it'll keep growing through this year as well. So um, this is sort of aiming to be, and is becoming, I think, the knowledge base for the agricultural domain writ large. Um, so that, that's pretty useful in terms of being able to find data uh, for researchers working in this domain and for others, for policymakers, for um, uh, funders, you know, who want to try and uh, assess what's, what's, you know, what, what to fund and what not to fund going forward. Um, what do you do with the data? Once you find it, you want to be able to do something with it. Um, I think Lillian mentioned the, the sort of needing access to more computational power, perhaps. Uh, she did a great job with what she had. Maybe she would have done even, even more if she had um, something like CG Labs at her hands. Um, so this is trying to answer the question of, I'd like to be able to find and securely exchange data, for instance, I'd like to manage code, I wanna analyze data with my team, um, some data is sensitive, so I don't really wanna you know, be sending files back and forth by email or Dropbox, please help. Um, this is a, a real life sort of uh, quandary that researchers face increasingly. Um, and CG Labs is intended to do just that. So there's some Slack-like functionality. You can set up your little work team, your lab team. Uh, you can, you can uh, collaboratively, co collaboratively work with as many um, uh, folks as you want. And here's the URL for that. So feel free to dive in and have a look. Um, I believe this, this presentation will be made available so you can look at it uh, later on. Um, the one thing here is when you sign in, you'll be clicking this orange button that says Globus. And so you must have a, a Globus account to do this. And why we're using this uh, Globus is because of that, uh, uh, the, the nature of the data that you might be actually interacting with. If it's sensitive data, then you, you, you want to, to have the highest levels of, of security available to you and Globus enables that. So we've chosen to go with this. It, it doesn't cost anything. If you have a, G, uh, a Google account, Gmail, or, or uh, if your institution is part of the Globus sort of uh, set of institutions, you should be able to very easily set up uh, an account and, and dive into CG Labs. Right, um, so then in, in terms of actually, once you're in CG Labs, what you'll see is you, you'll, you'll end up on a dashboard space, uh, but you can also look at group spaces and you can create your own group space. Um, by, by diving into group spaces and creating a new space. On the, on the left, the top right-hand side, you see uh, a little uh, space, you know, sort of when you've logged in, you see my space and you can work solely in your space, your private space, or you can set up these, this group space thing. And when you cl click on create new space, um, it's very simple. You get a pop-up, you're asked for your name, the name of your space, uh, a little descri description if you want it, um, and it walks you through. It's quite easy to use. Um, I do want to point out that that the the, the CG Labs is is it can be it enables a lot of functionalities and so uh, to get you started to to get you an overview and and help you use this we have quite a few user resources on the top right panel there that says getting started where my arrow just popped up so have a look um, see what you think. Um, now, in terms of what you can do, you can find data, as I mentioned. So you can work with your team. You can find data. Here, I've done a search for potato variety, and I find a bunch of data sets. Uh, some of them are listed with licenses that should allow you to download and actually work further with the data directly in CG Labs. But just so you know, some 
data sets, even though they're, um, they're listed as CC0 and CC BY, which are the least restrictive, they are still locked down in CGI repositories and may not be able to be downloaded. This is something we're still working on. Um, it's a culture change and, and there are other issues uh, that we have to, to, to work through here. But most data sets you find you'll be able to click on the little uh, box there as I've clicked those, those orange clicks and go to the bottom of the list, save them, and then you'll be able to actually work with that data. Now, when, you're, um, when, you're, uh, when you found the data, you may want to securely share data. And, and there's a secure upload button there. You can, you can share your data securely via Globus again. Uh, and to do this, uh, you should have installed the Globus client. And again, going to globus.org, you can do that quite easily. Um, and again, our, also again, our, our, our help uh, pages will, uh, our help resor resources will, will walk you through some of this. Um, to, to be able to securely share the data that you find. The other neat thing, uh, apart from analyzing data, is being able to explore that data. So here's a screen grab from uh, uh, exploring the data. We have several uh, data sets, large data sets. One is the, the spatial, uh, the SPAM uh, data set, which is the spatially, SPAM, uh, spatial, I can't remember what it stands for. Uh, spatial, pr spatial production allocation model. That's right. It's a, it's, a, it's a model that has global estimates for, for, for various parameters concerning about 33 odd crops, 33 to 35 crops. Um, so globally, you can look at uh, yield parameters, uh, rain fed yield, harvested area, uh, irrigated yield, and so on. There are about six parameters. You can choose one or more parameter, one or more crops, uh, and you can visualize the data and you can then pin the data just as I'm showing here for another data, uh, large data set, um, the functionalities are the same. Um, let me walk you through this really quickly. This is the, the CMIP6 uh, data set, which is a very large, I think seven or eight terabyte data set. We're making it available for you. You can, there are a number of different models uh, for that for that climate related data set. Um, here, there, one model has been chosen. Uh, I think that we're looking at maximum temperature. So that's the parameter that's been chosen. Um, and then when you, when you choose your, uh, uh, your, your model and your parameter, you can pin the region. So you go here to uh, the, the, the right-hand side, you choose the pin, you drop it either on a country or a region. So you can actually go further down than, than country level and then download the data. This is, in this case, uh, we're looking at, uh, at data for June 2030, really. Um, and you can go all, all the way up to uh, about uh, 2080, I believe, for this data set um, and, and download the data for that particular region, for that particular um, parameter that you've chosen, and the data is uh, downloaded for you as you can choose whether you want GeoJSON or, or CSV. So now here you, you actually have the data available and you're able to do something useful with the data in terms of actually downloading it um, and, then, and then using it further for uh, analysis. So several large data sets here are available for uh, visualization, data querying, and downloading. That's the key message here. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about with CG Labs is being able to analyze data. And so when you click on the analyze data, um, you get taken through a couple of clicks uh, to something that looks like this. So here, uh, what I'm seeing, the data sets I'm seeing are the data I've found from the find data uh, feature of CG Labs. And then once I find the data, I can actually do something with it. So I can, I can set up work folders for the data. I can manage code um, using the Git feature here from Git repositories, uh, I, I can code, I can upload the code back into my Git repositories. Uh, again, all the time working with collaborators. This is the power of CG Labs here. So um, I wanna show you a little bit uh, from a colleague um, at CIAD, in fact, who's, who's a power user of CG Labs. And he sits in Kali, or well, right now he sits in the, in the Netherlands, but, but his team may be in Kali. Uh, others he collaborates with may be in, in Nairobi. They're all working together on, on the, uh, using CG Labs for analysis of very, very heavy computational um, uh, tasks. Um, and so they, they're calling on uh, Amazon Web Services primarily through CG Labs, um, and they're, they're using GitHub at the same time. So it's 
you know, and it could be um, uh, Julian's repo, it could be uh, the team's repo, it could be some somebody else's public repository. Uh, it, it could be a, a lot of different sources, and you can all combine that um, in through the CG Labs coding interface. And then for data, of course, you're you're plugging in data that can be found. Uh, through CGIR's um, uh, uh, Guardian, through Guardian's repositories, which come from a variety of different da data sources that I that I showed you, um, or you can download data uh, from from data sources that are available uh, on the internet. Could be chirps, in this case, could be soil grids, a lot of other uh, sources of data that you can you can use here. So. I think this is, I use this, um, this slide from a, a, present, a recent presentation because I think it shows you very clearly what you can do with uh, CG Labs and, and how the whole system uh, comes together uh, with, with the find, being able to find the data and, and being able to do things with that data. And that's increasing the functionality that we want to get towards um, in, in this domain, as I think um, the, the presentations that, that went earlier showed you. And I believe that's my last slide. Um, so I will stop here and um, open up for questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Meta. I know that's a lot to get through with such a powerful platform and, and specifics of, of users. So um, I want to take it back to a kind of foundational concept of your work that I I'd love to hear if you think has taken on some new significance um, under the pandemic circumstances, but the fair data principle. So data being findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And in this time that we find ourselves a uh, crisis setting when researchers, you know, that are working from home, they're not able to access field sites, different activities have been stopped. Um, and data becomes of particularly high value as we want to be making um, data-based decisions uh, to guide us in the right direction. So will you talk about how um, the pandemic has kind of highlighted the importance of FAIR data and the platforms that enable its use. Absolutely, that's a good, good point. Um, so a lot of us are used to going out into the field, collecting our data, whether it's surveys or, or um, agronomic uh, field data, trial data. Um, what we don't realize is there may be a lot of data actually that has been collected that, that we can make use of. Uh, what we're trying to do through these efforts that I showed you, what the big data platform is trying to do is make sure that we're better able to leverage the, the, the data that, that's already there. Um, you know, data is often described as an iceberg with a lot of it underwater, um, a lot of it not visible. What we're trying to do through these efforts is make the data more visible uh, and make it more actionable through uh, making it findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable through the workflows and the standards that I, that I mentioned. And particularly when you have a crisis like this, um, it's very important to be agile in, in your uh, decision making and having access to the data can, can help you with that. So that's that's one uh, utility of it. Um, and the other, of course, is that you can't get out into the, into the field. It's been months that, that many of us have not been able to get out. Uh, that doesn't mean we sit around twiddling our thumbs. Maybe there's interesting exercises we can do with the data that we have on hand. So the question is, what can we do and, and how do we um, leverage that? That's the, that's the um, real utility of, of, of what we've tried to do through this platform. Yeah. Thank you. I have a, a lot of questions coming in, some of them quite specific. So maybe we can try and do some, some rapid fire answers around these. So uh, the first one is from Lennon. The code used for uh, using data in CG Labs is R or Python? Both. So um, it's an R and Python based environment. Sorry, okay. I should have mentioned that. Yeah. Okay, so next one. Um, from Jayoti Singh, I'm working on CMIP6 and DSAT for Bryce. How can I contribute my data, input as well as output, in this repository so that it can be used by a large community? I love that question. <laughs> so um, very shortly, we will have, um, you know, if you if you remember where I started with the with the with the Guardian um, data ecosystem, one of those cogs was uh, the workflows, essentially the ontology, metadata, etc. Uh, we we by the end of this month, we should have a sort of an upload uh, or annotate data and upload kind of workflow available, where you will go in. The first thing that'll happen is an, a PII checker through algorithms that will alert you to if if there's um, 
you know, if there's private information, names, geolocations, and then you decide what needs to be done with that. Um, and, and clean up the data set, or if it's just geolocations for, for fields, you, you put that up maybe. It, it's up to you to decide. Um, then you walk through and you annotate your data using consistent metadata schema. Uh, that makes it more accessible, the accessibility and the findability part. Um, and you um, uh, annotate the data set itself uh, using ontology terms. We've made it very easy. You don't need to understand what an ontology is to do this. Um, and then you go through and upload the data. You upload it either to directly into a Guardian dataverse that sits behind Guardian or to an institutional repository. If you want to do it to an institutional repository that's not a CGIR repository, you may have to work a little bit, but we're willing to work with you to help you on that. So um, just let us know if you're interested in uploading data and you, and you, but you want to put it in your institutional repository, we can try and help with that. Um, if it's not a CGIR repository or if it's not a dataverse um, that, that's easy to access for, for us, for Guardian. Uh, but once you do that, your data will play in the Guardian sandbox. So it becomes available then for others. And this has benefits, of course, for you as well as for those um, who are trying to use it. Yeah, I think so that thanks for that question, Jyoti. There's, there's another one of similar vein from, from Dr. Mat Motorana. Um, who says, as a speaker just mentioned about DSAT and Wolfost, W-O-F-O-S-T, um, can, can we automize if we don't have a source code? Um, yes, the source code for... It I'm sounds weird. The question goes on to say, in, in that case, how can we procure or link input or output data from remote sensing or other sources? So I thought it might be related to this, to the uploading um, previous question, but maybe it has more to do with source code, the source code part. Okay, I'm, I, should I be looking in the question and answers maybe? That's, uh, yeah, I see that. Can we auto, automato, automize that we don't have source code, that as we don't? Yes, yeah, so I think I think the, the key here is, you, if I'm, my understanding is correct, you want to use DSAT and, and Wolfast. Uh, and, and you have data that you want to plug into these models. So what we've done is, is have our versions of DSAT and Wolfast available. Um, the missing link right now, and we're trying to plug that as fast as we can, is to, um, to build the, the tr what, what are called translators. So when you find data from Guardian, for instance, um, or you upload data, that data may not necessarily be what, what's considered model ready. And, and the AgMIP team, the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project at the University of Florida, based at the University of Florida. We're working with uh, the group there uh, to, to leverage on the work they've already done with, with these translators that allow you to find data and to make it much more model ready so that now that sort of click, 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 I find the data and I put it into a model that's becoming more of a reality. We're still several steps away from it and, and quite some time away from it, but we're getting there. I mean, what we've got already is, uh, you know, the, the one end is built to find the data and the other end is built, which is the, the R versions of, um, we brought in the R versions of, of the models. Now we need to build the, the connection with the, with the translators, the, the work that, that's already been done. So we're trying to figure out how to build that in. I think that hopefully will answer your question. Yeah, I hope that was, I hope that was useful information. And there are a few more um, questions, Meta, for you in the Q&A box, it looks like, um, kind of specific. So if you, if you want to uh, answer those in the chat, feel welcome to. I want to transition us to um, just a, a brief group discussion as we wrap up, um, as we are a little bit over time, but I think this is really important. So I'd like to go and have each panelist um, kind of identify a key change that, that, um, that your data and, and work has been able to, um, to work towards building more resilient food systems um, throughout the pandemic, and then a new opportunity um, that the pandemic has presented. So if we, if, uh, we can go in order of, of speakers, if Lillian is up to, to starting us off, um, a, a key challenge or change and then a new opportunity that you've seen. So um, I think, um, you know, out of necessity, I built a model that does not rely on very much like on the ground data. So it actually, the conditions for my model have not changed very much over the last couple of months. Um, and a, 
uh, something that like an opportunity is I think that for the remote sensing and agriculture community as a whole, it's a great time to improve these technologies and um, I'm so impressed and fascinated by the tools that the other panelists presented for a remote monitoring of crop health. Uh, they're very powerful tools and I know that the technology will just continue to improve um, at a much faster rate because of the coronavirus pandemic. So there might be a lot of benefits to this pandemic that we didn't see at the beginning. Yeah. Thanks so much, Lillian. Thanks for joining us today. It was great to have you. Uh, you. Yarash, if you would like to weigh in with your, your challenge and opportunity. Yes. So again, thanks uh, for having here. I, I, I would say I would echo to what was uh, previously mentioned by the speaker. I think the technology has become more handy for us uh, when it comes to addressing some of the challenges. During the COVID, we have seen a lot of uh, data collection. Uh, we were not been in the field, but uh, thanks to the remote sensing data, we were able to uh, significantly monitor the issues where the communities are facing when it comes to not just the crop, but also knowing where the flood is happening, how the response team can use this data sets for variety of reasons to, uh, when it comes to insurance payout or uh, providing some food uh, related input. So I think technology can be a, a moderate solution when it comes to crisis management, but equally we need to look at more analytical tools like some of the speakers spoken about how do we also collect a lot of uh, digitally survey data sets. So we need to collect more field inputs as well. I think in the COVID has given again an opportunity for us to go more digitally. I would say a lot of people are now looking into mobile-based applications, ordering a lot of uh, seed inputs, or whether it is a fertilizer. I think these all will change the lifestyle of the farmers, not only the farmers, but also the researchers like me, uh, who would be more uh, dependent on more technology-driven automated process, then we can have more time to look at areas where we can really bring more analytical solutions. So I think uh, it's a very right direction. We are all uh, looking to work together on this field, making more interdisciplinary. That's again, uh, uh, bridging the gaps between social scientists to biophysical scientists. So all things are going well, in my opinion. So I don't have a big reservation on challenges, but Solutions are too many we have. Thanks Thank so much, Georgia. Sure, so sort of speaking from the perspective of farmers on the ground, I think one of the real challenges that has been seen over the last few months is that farmers have effectively seen on-farm extension services pretty much disappear overnight and access to, as people say, kind of on the ground validation of data, collection of data disappear. Um, and the opportunity, of course, is, is as I laid out, I really hope and I believe that the pandemic will bring about a step change in our ability to deliver this kind of information remotely and to be able to collect data remotely um, through a, a smartphone and through other channels that we now um, have access to. Thank you. And, and Meta, lastly, to wrap us up. Um, sure. I, I completely agree with what everyone has said before. And I think the, the challenge of, uh, in terms of data during the COVID crisis is pretty obvious in terms of data collection, for instance, not being able to, to get out there and, and, and firsthand collect data. Uh, but I think it does open up a lot of opportunities. Um, Georgia just mentioned some that I think all of the speakers have. Um, in, in terms of a challenge though, something that, that um, occurs to me is the, the need for, you know, I mean, with, with, with the responses that we have at, as researchers, we tend to have a lot of time between, you know, it's like, it's like somebody coming to the doctor and saying, I, I feel sick, um, and us giving the response as the doctors five years from now. And we need to be much more agile in, in what we do and how we do it. I think um, some of the, the so, so in terms of real-time data, being able to handle real-time data, being able to crunch through it, I think this relates also to Giriraj's question, is how do we enable that? And we're hoping that with, some, with the tools that we're building through the platform, with, with things like particularly CG Labs, we will be able to do that because we're allowing people to, to upload their own data sets, upload data sets they find, um, but, but 
collection of, of data in real time and being able to make it actionable is still a big challenge, I think. And, and we need to overcome that to be able to address um, the, the global sort of, uh, you know, to be able to make good on, on, on our mission, really. Yeah. I want to thank all of, all of our panelists for joining us this morning, um, providing such, such valuable insights. Thanks so much for sharing. And to the audience members, uh, great questions coming in and thanks for joining um, from all around the world this morning. The recording of this session will be available on our YouTube and our website um, in due time. And uh, please follow uh, us on Twitter, CGR underscore data for updates about upcoming panels. We're getting near to the end of this, of this digital forum. Uh, it's been a really enriching experience and um, should have just one or two more to, to wrap up the series. So thanks to everyone uh, for a great session. Um, it was an honor, honor to, uh, to moderate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.